Hi, I'm Todd Austin. Welcome to the fourth episode of my six-part tutorial on hardware security. In this fourth part, we'll be talking about side channel attacks. Side channel attacks are attacks that occur when attackers listen carefully to the public, publicly observable properties of a system and learn about its secrets. This is the fourth part of a six-part series on hardware security. In the first three parts, we talked about the importance of security in hardware and software. We did the basics of security, cryptography, hashing, signatures. In the previous episode, we talked about software hacking, software hacking that takes advantages of both software and hardware vulnerabilities. In this episode, we'll be looking at the other side of the attacker coin, uh, which are side channels, which are another class of attacks that can be made to uh, disclose secrets of the system based on what a system is is doing. So side channel attacks exist everywhere in our systems because as our systems compute, they leak information through uh, observable properties of the system. So for example, um, when a system computes, the software that is asking to be run varies the amount of energy that that system needs. A clever attacker can look at how the energy is being drawn by the system and can determine if, uh, if you know, information about the secrets within. As program runs, the behavior of the software will often change what code runs and that code could take different amounts of time. So if those behavioral changes are based on secrets inside the program, we can use the timing of the program to infer information about what's happening inside the program. As electronics operate, they emanate electromagnetic radiation from their circuits. And this is actually a rich source of information about what the internal chip is, is actually doing. There's a very interesting uh, class of side channels called fault-based side channels where we get a system to fail. And in that failure, we learn information about the secrets inside the system. We'll look at all these forms of side channels today. But one that we won't look at, but is also a very important one as well, is the social side channel. You know, if I want to get access to her computer here, maybe perhaps the best way is for me to just, you know, hand her a stack of cash and say, give me your password. And that's a, that's a social side channel. Um, as computer architects and hardware designers, we understand that almost every computing system out there today has a cache in it. So let's take a look at a, a classic cache-based side channel. And we'll see the properties that these side channels possess. And uh, then we'll maybe perhaps look at their relationship to how we design uh, computing systems. So in this particular case, I want to infer something about a secret in another program based on how it is executing and uh, fetching instructions. So let's say there's an if statement in this other program. And based on the if statement, if it's true or false, that'll reveal some information about a secret in the program. If it's true, it's gonna that, uh, that victim program is going to execute one piece of code. If it's false, it's going to execute another piece of code. Well, what I could do is if I'm sharing the cache with that program, I'm a different process. Uh, if I know the addresses of where those true and false code portions are, I can displace them from the cache. And if you study caches, you know that any process can displace everyone's data from the cache because it's shared. All I have to do is put loads and loads of my own data into the cache and I've displaced everyone else's. And then I interact with that victim process and I ask it to you know, do some computation based on that secret. And then I come back and I look at what, what my data is still in the cache. What is displaced will have been displaced by the code that was executed by the victim process. And now because we share that cache and because I am missing where my data was displaced, I can then infer, oh, you must have been that branch that you executed must have been true. And I can infer information about the secrets simply because we're in the same cache. And this, this is really emblematic of all the side channels that exist. 
And they do exist because of these three reasons. One, we share resources across security boundaries, inside a cache, inside a branch predictor, inside a virtual memory system. The physical resources are shared among many security domains where you know, a typical security domain is going to be the process context in mm -hmm. Linux or Windows, for example. The second thing that allows side channels to exist is we optimize the common case in systems so that I can tell if they're, you know, if the operation I'm performing is being affected by a victim process. So in the example of the cache, if my data is still in the cache, I get a fast asset, fast access to that data. And if it's been displaced by activities of the other process, I get a miss. And so I get a slower access to that data. Um, that those optimization features reveal information of how we're contending in that resource shared resource, the cache. And then finally, I need high precision timing measurements so I can infer what those uh, optimizations, whether they're being engaged or not. So I need high visibility performance or timing measurement capabilities. And it's interesting to look at this list because this list is the same list that you would present in a computer architecture class or a compiler class if you wanted to uh, tell someone how to build a high performance system, right? A, utilize your transistors as effectively as possible. We're going to share resources. We're going to share the cache, for example. Uh, second, optimize the common case. This is this is like rule number one for high performance computer architecture. Optimize, optimize, optimize from the common case to when it doesn't matter anymore. And the third, to give our programmers the ability to optimize their code, we're gonna provide them with high precision timing mechanisms. For example, on the x86 architecture, there's the RDTSC read timestamp counter instruction that let, gives you essentially cycle granularity timing, sub nanosecond timing in the user space. So. What's interesting about the this list is it says that there's this fundamental tension between high performance design and the creation of side channels. So uh, as a compiler developer, as a computer architect, uh, you want to be aware of that tension and, uh, and be aware that in your effort to produce a high performance machine, you may be creating side channels that could be exploited by attackers. It's not just the hardware and the compiler that creates side channels, programmers also create side channels. You know, they they are they contribute to the problem as much as the underlying system as well. This is a classic side channel, one of the first side channels really exploited. It's called the Coacher's RSA timing side channel, and then this 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 algorithm here is a um, it's a decryption algorithm in RSA, and basically what happens during decryption is we're going to we're going to take, we're going to do exponentiation of an encrypted packet by the uh, private key. Remember in the in lecture uh, two, we talked about asymmetric key cryptography. We have a public key and a private key. In this particular operation, we're decrypting the packet. So we're going to exponentiate it with the private key. And, and this is done with the square and multiply, classic square and multiply algorithm. It iterates in this loop and it's uh, it's checking to see if the bits of the private key are one and zero. If it if it if they are, it does this exponential uh, exponential. It does the multiply the modular multiplication, and if it's not, it just copies the value. It doesn't change the value at all. Uh, and so, uh, to, by executing this loop, you perform the exponentiation and you decrypt the uh, RSA packet. Now you'll notice here that. Uh, this operation where we just do nothing at all, we just carry the value forward, is it's instantaneous. It's really no, no computation is done. It's just a copy. And uh, when this operation occurs, uh, this is an, a modular multiply. And that's a very expensive operation and can be made even more expensive if we select the underlying ciphertext in a, in a, in a clever way. And so... Uh, What's interesting about this is for this implementation of RSA decryption, um, when the bit in the private key, which is this bit K here, is a one, we do a lot of work in the program. And when the bit is a zero, we do a little bit of work. So 
already you can see that like the amount of time it takes to do the decryption is going to be proportional to the number of ones in your private key. Now, of course, big, large private keys randomly selected, half of the bits are ones, so that doesn't really tell you much. But in Kocher's attack, you know, he, he tried to manipulate the ciphertext coming in to create opportunities where these modular exponentiations took an exceptionally long time in the underlying implementations. And then he would, uh, based on how the timing was affected, he could infer for that particular point in the computation whether or not the bit was a one or a zero and essentially just march down the line, creating different ciphertexts, creating different experiments, looking to see if the timing was heavily affected or not heavily affected, and basically inferred the ones and zeros simply from the program. This was a programmer implementation error. It's not an error in the RSA algorithm. The RSA algorithm is, you know, is, it still stands after many, many years. But this is an implementation which reveals information about secret key by the timing of the program. Uh, and then very quickly, uh, you know, the, the developer community started developing algorithms like the fixed width, width exponentiation algorithm, which has essentially fixed timing to implement this. So uh, the algorithms we use today are not this naive in terms of their timing. And, the, and they, they work really hard to be constant time for any, uh, any possible uh, private key. But interesting to see how the programmers can really contribute to leaking information through the timing of the program. Of course, the underlying microarchitecture has all those features we talked about early. It, it shares, you know, it shares across security boundaries, optimizes the common case, and there's high precision timing to take advantage of. Let's take a look at a, a classic microarchitectural cache-based side channel attack called Prime Plus Probe. And we're going to use this to infer from process A uh, what process B is doing by how we are interacting between process A and process B in the cache. So what process A is going to do is it's going to do what's called a prime of the cache. It's going to fill sets in the cache. You remember sets are these shared groups in the cache based on an address. It's going to fill its sets with its own data. And if it accesses that data, it's going to see bang, 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 hits all the way across. And that's going to go make a request to some process B, and it's going to ask it to do something. And process B is going to come in and do something. And based on secrets in the program, it'll either displace part of the data that was in process, A, uh, process A's data from the cache, or based on those secrets, won't displace that. And so the process A can come back and measure, pull their data back into the cache. If it's still there, hit fast. If it's not there, it'll take a miss. Oh, that's slow. So now it can infer what is the contention between us two in executing that. And I can use the same algorithm again, the same multiply and square algorithm from RSA. But this time, instead of looking at the uh, latency of the operations, I'm just looking to see, uh, did this, did these instructions get fetched? So process A is priming the cache, displacing these instructions out of the cache. And then process B comes and we can very quickly see if it took an iCache miss here because that will displace some of the data from process A. So the basic approach is, is process A is continually displacing those instructions out of the cache. They're both running at the same time. And it's looking to see how many times and how often, what, and what is the timing of that contention, which is essentially proportional to when the bits in the processing of the decryption are one. And you can very quickly pull that information out in just a few experiments, what that private key is. Really incredibly exceptional attack. Uh, and then, you know, the key here is to try and uh, make unknown to process A where that code is in process B, right? And so we'll learn later when we get into the, the fifth episode of this, there's this thing called address space layout randomization, where when processes start, we put their information in random places in the address space. And that does make it hard, although there's lots of attacks to do what's called de-randomize ASLR and figure out where the code is on another process. <clears throat> but one of the easiest ways to implement this attack is to do it on a shared library. In a shared library, uh, the system is entirely designed to make sure that there's only one copy of that library 
in the caches at one time. So it's mapped in a way where when I access the shared library, I am accessing the same data, the same cache lines as when another process does this. And on a virtual machine, this is even the case, two virtual machines accessing the same library can be shared in the L1 cache. It's, it, it reduces the amount of storage you need. And so quickly attackers figured out, this is the way I attack these machines. So uh, the library that they would attack would be like SSL.a, the open SSL library. It's shared between my virtual machine and your virtual machine on the same server. And now when I make requests to your server, I can see how you're displacing uh, the shared instructions out of our cache. I'll displace them. You'll bring them back. I'll displace them. You'll bring them back. Now I know your ones and zeros that you're, that of your exponentiation. It was such an effective attack that today in the cloud, they do what's called deduplication. They don't allow any sharing of libraries across virtual memory boundaries. And that costs us a lot of performance and storage space, but it, it's necessary uh, to stop attacks like this. All right. So that, that last attack, that was a microarchitectural attack. Uh, the, and the one before that coach's attack was a software side channel. So now let's take a look at a analog side channel. So any Im any emanations, be they timing from the microarchitecture, be they timing from the program, be they power from the circuits can be used to uh, pull information out of a program. In this particular attack, we have uh, access to the the computing device. And so and we can and we can closely monitor its power. Now you're not going to do that in Azure, right? But you could do that on a chipped credit card. You know, it's got secrets inside and we can control and very closely monitor the power going in and out of that. So this is appropriate for uh, appropriate style of attack when you have physical access to the device. Um, and so what we're going to do here is um, we're going to run the device in a way where um, we set the inputs and then ask it to do operations that involve the secret inside the device. And, you know, let's say we're doing an AES encryption, you know, we're not going to be able to guess those bits that are happening inside there. And so we're going to use side channels to give us information about, uh, you know, intermediate steps of those cryptographic operations. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to try and look at, you know, smaller chunks of the work being done and trying to infer what those secrets are. And, the, and we're going to do that by um, understanding how the algorithm works, inferring what the circuits would be to perform those algorithms, and then trying to estimate how much energy would be consumed based on my fixed inputs that I'd give it uh, if the key were one or the key were zero. And then by doing that estimation, we can come up with a pretty good estimate of what the key should be in those areas that we're analyzing. So here's a here's a simple power analysis attack. Again, this is the RSA algorithm doing modular exponentiation. In this case, we're not worried about timing. We're not worried about the instruction cache uh, fetches of this uh, of this nefarious operation that occurs when there's a one bit. Now we're just worried about how much energy is being consumed. And when this particular operation occurs, we're going to light up the multiplier. The multiplier is going to consume a massive amount of energy. It's a big, hefty piece of logic. And so we're going to see small spikes on the power draw, that DIDT, the rate of energy is going to spike every time we do those multiplies. And so now I just have to basically look at energy draw over time. And I can, you know, I can literally pick the ones out when it engages the multiplier. And, and so in a single pass, I can now know what that private key is. So uh, that is a very powerful method uh, if you have physical access to the device. You know, how would you eliminate this particular kind of leak? Oh, this is a tough one to eliminate. Uh, probably the most common technique to eliminate this is to use what's called dual rail logic, where I take and do computation that I want to protect. And then I do essentially the De Morgan's uh, equivalent of that computation. So when, when this logic is pulling energy from the power grid, this logic is throwing it to the ground. And so you essentially get this very uh, smooth um, draw of energy. 
The challenge here is what if the process variation on this logic is different than the process variation on this logic? Process variation is it has to do with the fact that when you manufacture circuits, it's it's basically a baking process. And so there's a little bit of variation in the speed and the power demand of different circuits. And so when these two circuits were designed to use the same amount of power, but this one uses a little bit more. And now if I run this, you know, one time, I don't see that power differential because it's so close. But if I run it a billion times and measure the total energy consumed, now I start to see a power differential. So that's called a differential power attack. And they're very, very effective in the analog space. Really difficult to stop. I would argue probably impossible to stop. So you want to you look at other defenses that don't rely on people not being able to measure your energy. You want to somehow eliminate their ability to know what's going on, even if they can measure that power. Okay. Fault-based attacks, super cool attacks. This is an opportunity uh, type of attack where you may have physical access to the system and you can manipulate it in a way to fail, or maybe the operators of the system are not doing as good a job at maintaining quality of operation and they're having their system fail. This is an attack I did with uh, my colleague, Professor Valeria Bertacco here at Michigan uh, years ago. It was a fault-based attack of RSA. And basically what we did is if you remember the RSA attack uh, for authentication, you send a message to a server, the server then signs it with a private key and then sends that message back. And then you decrypt it with the public key. And if it matches the original message, you know, oh yeah, I'm whoever uh, encrypted this message holds the private key associated with the public key that I just decrypted it with. And uh, so in a fault-based attack, we want that encryption operation to fail. So I send my message and, you know, uh, say a prayer and hopefully that thing will fail. How do you get it to fail? Well, when we originally did this attack, the way we uh, suggested it could fail is, you know, there's a lot of multiplies in this, op in these operations. Multiplies are typically running very close to the critical path of the design. And, uh, and so, you know, if the, if you have a lot of heat in your data center and you're not cooling it sufficiently with some small probability, there could be a failure in one of the computation steps of the signing of the encryption under the private key, and that could yield a faulty signature. Um, and so, you know, could that happen? I think that probably probably does happen on a regular basis. You know, there's a lot of work in the computer architecture community today on what I call silent data corruptions in the data center where, you know, operations just fail because of various things, soft errors, radiation interactions, and maybe heat and other things. And so, so what's interesting about a fault-based attack is uh, when you decrypt it, you don't get the original message back again. But if the fault was towards the end of the computation, and typically these faults are going to be sort of uniformly across there. So you're going to have to collect many of these. In our original experiments, we collected 1,800 faulty messages for the same signing the same message. And then we would go through them and, and essentially we would look for, is one of these messages have a fault at the very end of the computation? We would wind back the computation, guess the four bits of the key, because this particular algorithm was based on a four-bit fixed width exponentiation algorithm. And then and then flip bits to undo the uh, computational error. And then what happens is if you get the right signature out, you've guessed those four bits of the private key. You've guessed them. They're yours to have. And then you, you basically scan through all of your error your bad signatures to look for something that has an error in the second to the last four bits. And again, you do that same operation and you sort of work your way back. If you, if you miss one of the, one of the windows, you don't have anything that tells you what that is. Then, then you just have, now your problem is 16 times harder because you got to guess all those, but you work your way back and eventually you can get the entire key. And we did this in about, I think two days was of server time. We were able to pull out that key. That was a lot of fun. We presented it at black hat, um, and then RSA 
uh, RSA uh, put out a press release saying that this was not a concern. And I learned that like, nothing makes your attack more of a concern than when the company that affects puts out a press release that this attack is not a concern. So it was, it was, it was all around fun, fun uh, activity and, and really, you know, put a highlight on the importance of, you know, good server maintenance uh, if you want to protect your private key. All right. Here's another kind of side channel that exists in the form of, it doesn't reveal secrets per se of the computation, but instead reveals who is performing the computation. In the 2010s, early 2010s, there was a lot of focus in the architecture community on approximate hardware. And the basic idea was, um, we're going to run these computations, machine learning, inference, whatever, um, in you know, with a CPU and memory, but we're going to starve them for energy. And occasionally, circuits are going to fail. The advantage there is you're going to save a lot of energy, uh, which is important when you're, you know, when you know, machine learning operations you know to build large language models that are consuming more energy than the state of Vermont it makes sense to find ways to reduce that energy draw uh, and what was nice about machine learning is you could actually train the models to tolerate these occasional faults so you, when you do your training you you also inject faults into the system and so then when you do your inference and there's an occasional fault it doesn't even affect the performance of the machine the accuracy is exactly the same really impressive work that I think, you know, will become more important as energy becomes more important for machine learning. But what uh, what Reacher showed was that the, the how the errors occur, and they are in the final results, become a fingerprint for who did that computation. So, um, you know, and people say, well, is that really that important? Uh, yeah, it's actually really important. Generating a fingerprint for a piece of hardware is what you need to track systems that don't allow those systems to be tracked. When this video is being recorded right now, uh, mid-2023, uh, Google recently announced their topics, uh, sort of anti-tracking infrastructure, where uh, you essentially, you don't track you as a person. Uh, Google allows vendors to track your interests and you can delete those interests, enhance those interests, et cetera. So it's, it's like an anti-tracking technology. You know, I'm sure advertisers would still love a way to be able to tell who am I, who am I interacting with right now. And very recently, there was an attack from UC Davis um, where they did a row hammer attack, and they were able to reproduce the same effect, where the bits that flipped from row hammer were uh, emblematic of the machine that it was actually running on, and they created very good signatures that showed you basically. Uh, what machine amount you implement that attack inside JavaScript. And now an advertiser, you know, can figure out exactly who you are. So this is another interesting secret that can leak out from hardware. The reason why this hardware produces these effects is due to what's called process variation. Again, the DRAM as it's manufacturing, there's tiny variations in that sort of, VLSI baking process that creates it, there's variations in the amount of capacitance of these individual cells. And so when the DRAM starts to fail through row hammer or other means, the where those failures occur is specific to this physical piece of hardware. Very interesting attack. Something I think that, you know, people who are concerned about tracking should be very well aware of these, these potential vulnerabilities. All right. Uh, next, I want to what I want to talk about is the is the Spectre meltdown attack, which you know I personally absolutely adore this attack simply because you know it's a it's a really brand new side channel. It's in the transient execution of a, of a processor, but also this attack really put hardware security on the map. I was working on hardware security a decade before this attack came, but the the arrival of this attack um, made computer hardware security really important and then row hammer combined with that that was like one two punch and now people are concerned about hardware security as they should be um you know when i go visit uh cpu vendors and talk to the architects there uh the mere mention of the word specter and meltdown will you know they'll grab their forehead and go oh man you know they they're 
architects are really concerned about this particular attack. It's a rich attack. There's so many interesting variants on this theme. And the basic idea, the way I like to describe it is it's basically, it's an attack that uses misspeculation. Now, what is mis you know, if you've taken computer architecture classes, you know, when processors get to a branch and they don't know the direction of the branch, they do a prediction and then they follow the code on their prediction. Now, if they mispredicted the branch, they throw away the results in the form of register writes and stores, but uh, they don't throw away how they affect the cache and the microarchitecture. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what these attacks allow you to do is the clever attacker can run any code they want, any code they want. Oh, you're running a Rust interpreter and it's preventing you from going past the end of the array. I will simply prime your BTP and branch predictor to go past the end of the array when Rust checks kick in at commit and you find out, hmm, I shouldn't have gone past that end of the array. It's too late. I've already executed code and I've left mouse tracks in your microarchitecture that I can probe from another process. So what's really interesting about this tech is it allows code injection on machines that do not allow code injection. And so everywhere in the world where software developers are thinking, I've stopped code injection, they need to look at this attack because this is code injection on machines that do not allow code injection. All right. So let's continue on this particular attack. The way it works, I'm going to show specifically Meltdown. And Meltdown is going to, uh, what it's going to perform is a speculation attack. The speculation is not on branches for Meltdown, but it's actually on whether or not an instruction had an exception. So that is, is in, sense, in essence a control speculation because if the exception was known, we would have gone to uh, we would have gone to the exception handler right away. But since exceptions are typically detected at commit time, uh, when there is an exception, we're not going to execute that that exception right away until we get to commit time. So the code is going to continue as if there were no exception. This particular exception has to do with how Linux arranged the address space. To make switching between the address, the kernel, and the operating system as efficient as possible, what Linux did is they, they made that top half of the address space kernel data. They made the lower uh, section of the address space uh, user data. And then to do a fast contact switch, they would just give access to that upper part of the address space. Now, in if you're running a user program and it accesses the data up in the top part of the address space, you get an exception. The problem, though, is those mm -hmm. exceptions are recognized at commit. So in the misspeculation stream, where we didn't know we were going to have an exception, the instructions continue to execute. So what do you do? Well, you load a piece of kernel data that the user program has no business to see. You pick off one bit of that, and then you go and access a piece of memory in the user space. That piece of memory in the user space has been pre-depleted or, or taken out of the cache so that after the exception occurs and we've thrown away all the computation, I can see if the misspeculation attempted to load the zero location or the one location leaking a single bit out of the upper part of the address space. So it's two things happening here. One, the ability to inject code on a machine that's not wanting me to inject code because I'm doing it in the misspeculation space. And two, misspeculation only recovers registers and memory. It's not recovering the state of the microarchitecture because the state of the microarchitecture is non-binding. And because that microarchitecture is shared, I can come back in this process or another process and figure out what are those little mouse tracks? Did you load the zero line or did you load the one line? And I can get that information out. Incredibly, incredibly uh, clever attack, effective attack, hard to stop. So beautiful, so beautiful. Uh, now, Spectre is a little bit different. Spectre is actually going to prime the branches so that it can run the code you want. And advanced forms of Spectre are going to prime indirect branches. So now I'm just injecting code. I'm running whatever I want. I'm going to run this piece of code, follow that piece of code, follow that, that piece of code. So, you know, you may be rust. You may be checking to see if you're going past the end of branches. 
in misspeculation, you're not going to have that option of stopping me from doing these loads. Really clever. How do you stop these attacks? This is a sort of a key focus of computer architecture today. Personally, I think you can't stop these attacks. You just can't stop them. You have to build defenses that live with these attacks. You know, whenever I see someone specter to melt down something out of out of a, a secure domain, I always think to myself, you should have encrypted that because <laughs> it's it's really hard. There's so many places to leak information. Speculation capabilities are so rich in the microarchitecture. But there's a lot of examples, you know, like try to stop the cache side channels by, you know, separating security domains in the cache. Uh, there's things like uh, in, invisible speculation where we do our speculation to these resources. And when they commit, we then move them. There's many, many gyrations. But you, the arms race has started here. You see uh, you see that a proposal occur in one conference, and then you see it being broken in the next conference, and then another proposal to fix that breaking. I even was at a conference recently, and someone proposed... Uh, a defense. And then in the question session at the end, someone asked a question and they weren't really sure they'd be able to stop that variant on the attack. So it this arms race is off and running. And if you're going to be a computer architect, you got to be aware of it. So there's a website called transient.fail, which covers the full gamut of different kinds of speculation, transient uh transient speculation attacks. The landscape is pretty rich um, in that um, the type of security defenses they're trying to subvert varies to the place where the information is being leaked out varies in the uh, where that is in the microarchitecture. Uh, and, and it's really clear that this style of attack is really impressively uh, rich in terms of what it can do and you know consequently if you're an architect in industry today you're probably spending a non-trivial amount of time worrying about this type of attack personally i think it's going to be pretty hard to stop these and that we really need to start building defenses that don't require um the stopping these transient uh speculation attacks and then I just wanted to uh, share with you at the end of this lecture, one of my uh, all-time favorite microarchitectural side channels. This came from the Net Spectre paper, which was uh, a Spectre attack that you could do over the internet. And in order to implement that attack, they, they, the, uh, the researchers needed a really high latency signal that could be initiated. And what they used was on x86 processors from Intel, the powering up and powering down of the AVX2 unit. So AVX2 are these big 256-bit vector units. They're very large uh, functional units that do vector computation on floating point values. And so... Uh, if you don't use these units for some period of time... Uh, part or all of the units can be powered down, or they actually gate the power going into the unit so they don't even leak uh, any energy. And say it's, it's an energy conscious approach to maintaining these units because you know often a system doesn't need any vector math, and so we can power down these units and we can save a, a bunch of energy. Uh, and this is, this is all in the microarchitecture; it's hidden from the programmers. And when the programmers decide, hey, I need to do a vector operation. Uh, that first instruction takes about a 366 cycle delay as they're powering up, you know, they're, they're recharging the power grid on this uh, very large vector unit. And that 366 cycle delay is, is actually long enough that you can sense it remotely. If you, so if you would do a specter attack, the idea with that specter is you, you do a specter attack and you you access you prime the branch predictor or do a meltdown style uh, attack. You prime the branch predictor to get to the code you want to read that you're not supposed to read. You pull out your bit, and then you you have to communicate out. It's this bit that I've read speculatively as zero or one. So normally you would do that by accessing elements in the cache. In this particular microarchitecture side channel, if the bit is a zero, you would do nothing. 
And so we would just ensure that the AVX2 unit, which was powered down when we started this deck, remains powered down. And then we do another, uh, you know, like a buffer overflow attack on the system or, 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 or do an operation that excites the AVX2 unit naturally in its operation. And we look to see if that unit was powered down or not powered down by how long it takes to do that remote request. And if it was powered down, then we know that the mm -hmm. uh, specter attack was trying to communicate out of zero. Now, in the event we want to communicate out of one, we, you know, we prime the branch predictors. We go read our storage that we're not supposed to have access to. We see that the bit we want to communicate out is a one. So then what we do is before we stop speculating, we jump to an instruction that does an AVX2 vector operation. And so that during the specter transient attack, we then power up the unit. And then when we get back, uh, when we do our, our our remote access to a normal access of the AVX2 unit, we see that it comes back much more quickly and uh, because the unit was already powered up because of our transient speculation attack. So now we know that uh, that uh, that that the bit that they wanted to communicate to us was one. And, and in the NetSpectre paper, they, they, they even were able to demonstrate the, the leaking of uh, this information uh, remotely over the internet. Very impressive attack, and and a really impressive use of uh, of a microarchitectural side channel. You know, how do you? And the the, the point I want to make with this is like, how do you? You know, some well-meaning engineer at Intel was thinking, I want to save the world a little bit of carbon production here. I'm going to power down this unit, and oh, lo and behold, I've now created a microarchitecture side channel that someone can use to leak data out on the internet. And, and the point I'm making here is is that uh, you know, in my mind, the idea of trying to stop microarchitectural side channels is pretty laughable to me. There's so many ways that you can create these shared interactions among units. And again, this this follows the first slide that I had, right? The sharing here is the power lines. We're sharing the power lines. The optimization is the powering down of the power lines, which causes more latency when you have to power it back up. So it follows those, those those same things. So even trying to reduce energy, I'm creating opportunities for side channels. So, you know, should we give up hope and know there's no security in our microarchitecture? You know, personally, I believe, you know, if you want to protect data, you have to encrypt that data and then you don't have to worry about stuff like this. So really interesting uh, side channel and, and delighted to share that with you. It's so much fun to see this. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to the, the other side channels that people will discover in the future. Uh, okay, so some discussion points on side channels. Um, is it possible to close down a side channel completely? To a certain extent, yes. And I'll point out a couple examples. Programmer-based side channels can be shut down through the use of what's called data-oblivious programming. Data oblivious programming is when you use discipline in how you write your programs so that you don't make decisions based on secrets in your program. When you write programs that way, and it's been shown for many decades that this is actually Turing complete, you can actually write any algorithm that you want to implement in a way where its behavior is not dependent on secrets. Um, certainly the possibility. And when you do that style of programming, then the program does not have control or memory side channels. It can still have microarchitectural side channels, but we were able to shut down the side channels in the program that is leaking information. Can microarchitectural side channels be fully addressed? I mean, that seems to me a little bit more difficult to implement simply because of the many interactions and the massive amount of microarchitectural state that exists in modern microarchitectures. Possibly, but I think it would be have to be a fairly simple machine to shut down all those microarchitectural side channels. One way to silence side channels in a more reliable manner is to do security domain isolation. Can we isolate domains from each other in the microarchitecture? Of course, when we do that, we're preventing sharing of the microarchitecture resources. So there'll undoubtedly be some performance impact because of that. Can microarchitectural side channels be addressed without sacrificing performance? I think I kind of answered that one. If you're doing it by isolation, you're probably going to have a performance impact. 
if you're doing it by encryption, encrypt the data that you care about, that'll probably have a performance impact as well. It seems like there's this link between silencing sign channels and uh, and and performance impacts. Uh, and hopefully, architects can mitigate that as much as possible. Um, but you know, it'll be interesting to watch research in the years ahead to see if that that link can be broken to, in some fashion or not. And then finally, how much stock should we put on attacks that have unrealistic favorable prerequisites? And I gave an example of. Bernstein's attack, which is a, a cache-based attack where to implement this particular attack, the attackers needed like cycle accurate measurements of their uh of how long it took to do cache misses. And I would say I'm a fan of letting the first version of attack have as much information as possible with the most pristine conditions. And you know, there's a kind of a general rule of computer security that over time attacks get better. And one of the ways attacks get better is they start relaxing. Okay. I, now I don't need cycle accurate information on how many misses that are occurring because I've now discovered a way to implement this attack a billion times and accrue the total difference in time. You know, that's called typically a differential attack. And so um, I'm very much favorable of early attacks being you know, having very pristine environments, maybe difficult to uh, reproduce in the real world uh, because it lets researchers know that that these attacks exist and if people are able to normalize the you know better normalize the conditions under which they can be implemented then then we need to start worrying about them so let's learn about them as early as possible through these very pristine environments where we produce proof of concepts and and start working on them as early as possible All right, and here's a few papers that I reference in this section of the lecture. Uh, go ahead and pause here and, and take a look at these if you want to learn more about these papers. And that's side channels. Side channels come from programs. They come from the microarchitecture. They come from the physical circuits. And they come from the people that operate the computers that we care about. So silencing those sign channels can be a big challenge because of the relationship between high performance design and side channel free design. There's, there's a definite tension between those two things. Um, as we go forward into the next unit, we're going to start talking about how to mitigate some of these side channels and how to mitigate our exposure to hardware and software hacking. So uh, if you have any questions about this work, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be glad to answer your questions. I always enjoy interacting with my YouTube viewers. Uh, please like and subscribe this channel. Uh, I'll be sending more of these videos along the way in the next couple of, of weeks. And uh, thank you for watching the video and uh, have a great day. Take care.